Hi guys, Dr. Scott Cleos here with my daughter Juliana, and today we're talking about magnetism. Now, we're all familiar with the standard magnet. You can get it at any hardware or hobby store. Place it over an iron bar, and voila, instant magic. However, what you may not know is that this magnetic phenomenon is actually the real-world manifestation of the quantum properties of the atoms that make up the steel bar, and there are at least three different types of magnetism, including ferromagnetism, paramagnetism, and diamagnetism represented by these four metallic cylinders, iron, gadolinium, copper, and zinc. We are all most familiar with ferromagnetism, the strongest of the three mentioned magnetic forces. When connected to a strong magnet, the iron itself becomes strongly magnetic and picks up all the steel BBs. In fact, the iron cylinder doesn't even have to have direct contact with the fixed magnet. It just needs to be in the magnetic field to remain strongly magnetic. Moving the fixed magnet into the proximity of the iron cylinder, the two attract just before the third screw of the base. Paramagnetism, represented by gadolinium, is much weaker than ferromagnetism. When connected to the same fixed magnet, the gadolinium tugs on the BBs, but the induced magnetic field is too weak to actually lift the BBs from the base. Moving the magnet in the proximity of the suspended gadolinium cylinder, the two attract just after the third screw of the base. And finally, diamagnetism, represented by the copper and zinc, shows no apparent attraction to the fixed magnet or the steel BBs, but we'll take a closer look at that in a moment. Now, to really understand the concept of magnetism, we need to review some of the properties of the atom, specifically electron configuration. Classically, we depict the neutral atom as a central nucleus of protons and neutrons with a randomly orbiting cloud of negatively charged electrons, the number of which is identical to the number of positively charged protons in the nucleus. In fact, the electron cloud is highly organized by energy levels into shells, subshells, and orbitals. This is a difficult topic, so we're going to break it down for you, but you still may have to watch the video a few times to understand some of the concepts. However, using this model, we can explain a lot of the properties of the elements of the periodic table, including electrical conductivity and magnetism. Let's start with a few basic rules and definitions. The shells are the largest division of the electron groups and are labeled either with the letters starting with K on the innermost shell or more practically, numerically, with the innermost shell labeled number one. In our model, only three shells are depicted. Now each shell contains a series of subshells labeled sequentially S, P, D, F, G, H, and I. And theoretically, the maximum number of subshells in each shell is determined by the shell number itself. For instance, shell 1 contains a single subshell, S. Shell 2 contains two subshells, S and P. Shell 3, S, P, and D. Shell 4, S, P, D, and F. Shell 5, S, P, D, F, and G, etc. Furthermore, each subshell contains a fixed odd number of orbitals beginning with 1 in S, 3 in P, 5 in D, 7 in F, 9 in G, 11 in H, and 13 in I. Finally, each orbital can contain a maximum of two electrons, and therefore, the maximum number of electrons that can be contained in each subshell can be determined simply by multiplying the number of orbitals times two. This gives two electrons in S, six in P, 10 in D, and 14 in F. G, H, and I orbitals would contain 18, 22, and 26 electrons respectively, but would only be necessary for the theoretic elements above the heaviest element currently on the periodic table, oganesson, a synthetically created unstable element with an atomic number of 118. The first element that would need the G subshell has three more electrons in its outer orbit with an atomic number of 121. This theoretic element, called unbionium, with a chemical symbol UBU, is again, as far as we know, way too unstable to actually exist. So, going back to our model, we can determine the theoretic maximum number of electrons in each shell by simply adding up the electrons utilizing the rules above, 
or we can get the same answer with the simple formula 2n squared, where n equals the shell number. For example, shell 1, with its single s subshell and single orbital, has a maximum of 2 electrons. Using the formula, 2 times 1 squared equals 2. Shell 2 has 2 electrons in the s subshell and 6 in the p subshell. Remember, there's 3 orbitals with 2 electrons in each orbital for a total of 8 electrons. 2 times 2 squared equals 8. Shell 3 has 2 electrons in the s subshell, 6 in the p, and 10 in the d subshell for a total of 18. 2 times 3 squared equals 18. And shell 4, not depicted in this model, but utilizing our rules and formula, we know that there are 2 electrons in the s subshell, 6 in p, 10 in d, and 14 in f for a total of 32. 2 times 4 squared equals 32. And this pattern can theoretically continue ad infinitum. If we ever find a tenth shell, it could contain a maximum number of 200 electrons. 2 times 10 squared equals 200. But as for now, no known element goes beyond the seventh shell. Now that we have the basic pattern, we still need one more piece of information before we can determine the electron configuration of any element on the periodic table. For shells 1 and 2, the subshells are filled sequentially. First filling the S subshell, and then the P. However, in subshell 3, something changes. Remember the shell number determines the theoretic maximum number of subshells. So shell 3 should have three subshells, S, P, and D. However, the D subshell actually exists at a higher energy state than the S subshell of shell 4. So after 3P is filled, the next electrons fill the 4s subshell. This is known as the Aufbau principle. Aufbau is German for construction or building up and basically states that the electron orbitals are filled sequentially by first filling the lowest available energy state before occupying the higher energy levels. Fortunately, this pattern is predictable, and as a nod to the scientist that contributed to its discovery, is defined by various honorary titles, including the Madelung Rule, Janet Rule, Klachowski Rule, or generally, the Diagonal Rule. I've seen this pattern presented a number of ways, but this one seems the most intuitive and readily demonstrates why it's called the Diagonal Rule. Of course, the first orbital to fill in all atoms is in the lone s subshell of shell 1, labeled appropriately 1s. If one electron is in the orbital, this is the element hydrogen. If two electrons, the element helium. Since the s subshell only contains one orbital and the first shell only contains one subshell, the entire first shell is now complete. Notice the position of helium to the far right of the periodic table. This is the first member of the noble gases a series of elements that do not react easily with other atoms as they contain a full complement of orbiting electrons in their outer shells. Now let's start filling out our diagonal table so we can demonstrate some of the patterns that will ultimately help you figure out the electron configuration of almost any element on the periodic table. We'll start of course with shell number one. As we said before, this shell has one subshell, S. So we'll place that in the left upper corner of the screen. Shell 2 will have two subshells, S and P, and we'll place that on the next line. Shell 3, three subshells, S, P, and D. Shell 4, four subshells, S, P, D, F. Shell 5, five subshells, S, P, D, F, and G. Shell 6, S, P, D, F, G, H. Shell 7, S, P, D, F, G, H, I. And shell 8, S, P, D, F, G, H, I, and J. To determine the filling order, we draw diagonals from right to left starting with the uppermost available subshell in the column. For instance, the first arrow goes through 1s, giving us the simplest of all elements, hydrogen and helium. The next diagonal goes through 2s, and the next subshell to fill is 2p. When 2p has its full complement of 6 electrons, we are at our second noble gas, neon, with 10 orbiting electrons. Then we fill 3s. When 3p is completely full with its 6 electrons, we are at our third noble gas, argon, with 18 orbiting electrons. After the 3p4s arrow, things get a little funky. 
We go back to the third orbital, 3D, and then to 4P, bringing us to our fourth noble gas, Krypton, with 36 orbiting electrons. Now you can see the diagonal pattern that gives the table its name. Hopefully now you also recognize that a full complement of six electrons in the P shell determines each of the noble gases on the rows of the periodic table below row 1. So neon completely fills 2P, argon 3P, krypton 4P, xenon 5P, radon 6P, and the previous theoretic element, unanoctium, renamed to oganesson after its successful synthesis in 2002, 7P. The first shell doesn't have a P shell, so helium simply fills its lone S shell, but is still a noble gas with all its available orbitals filled. In addition, looking at our diagonal table, all the other subshells before the P subshell will be completely full as well. Therefore, when writing out the electron configuration of each element, we can either start from the beginning and include every subshell from shell 1 on, or we can simply abbreviate the nomenclature using the previous noble gas in parentheses and listing just the outer valence electrons of the element itself. For instance, the largest naturally occurring elemental atom is uranium. With 92 electrons, the entire electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2, 2p6, 3s2, 3p6, 4s2, 3d10, 4p6, 5s2, 4d10, 5p6, 6s2, 4f14, 5d10, 6p6, 7s2, 5f3, 6d1. We can abbreviate the same using the previous noble gas radon and simply listing the valence electrons 7s2, 5f3, 6d1. And since the chemical, electrical, and magnetic properties are predominantly defined by the outer orbital or valence electrons, this is probably a more practical descriptor for our purposes. Looking at our table, we can see where the orbitals of the G, H, and I subshells would begin to fill in shells 5, 6, and 7 respectively. But again, no known naturally occurring element is stable enough to have electrons in the G or higher subshells with the electron configuration of our heaviest known element, uranium, filling the D subshell of shell 6. The first element predicted to utilize the G subshell would have an atomic number of 121, the hypothetical element, unbionium, with the symbol UBU and predicted electron configuration of oganesson, 8s2, 5g1. One final thing before we move on to magnetism. For the purposes of this discussion, we've modeled the orbitals of the subshells as simple rings on which the electrons rotate. Unfortunately, things are much weirder than that. The single orbital in the S subshell is the only one that looks like a classic sphere. These are the three orbits in the P subshell with the two colors representing the statistical pass of the two electrons in each orbital. In the D subshell, things get even stranger with the center of five orbitals, D0, showing this unusual disk centrally with two peripheral nodes. And finally, the seven orbitals of the F subshell are even more complex. You may recall the duality of subatomic particles as well as light quanta, all of which show characteristics of both waves and particles simultaneously. With regards to location in 3D space, Electrons orbiting the nucleus of an atom behave more like waves than particles we modeled. And the theoretic possible location of these particles can be determined by the quantum wave function, represented by the Greek letter psi. Using this equation, in some of the higher order subshell orbitals, the statistical possible location of the electrons can actually calculate to zero, giving these weird patterns of electron distribution. Probably not important for this particular discussion, but we did think it was worth mentioning. The Aufbau principle is a great guide to quickly figure out elemental electron configurations, but there are some exceptions throughout the periodic table. The first exception occurs between elements 23 and 24, vanadium and chromium. Vanadium's electron configuration is argon, 4s2, 3d3, with an atomic number of 23. We would expect the next element, with an atomic number of 24, to be argon, 4s2, 3d4, but chromium's electron configuration is actually argon, 4s1, 3d5, which produces a more stable configuration than the expected pattern. Other examples occur between nickel and copper, zirconium and niobium, rhodium and palladium, as well as iridium and platinum.
Finally, at the bottom of the periodic table with the rare earth lanthanides and radioactive actinides, the 5D and 6D subshells respectively seem to randomly appear and disappear like little subshell ghosts throughout the series. Otherwise, the off-ball principle is pretty solid. Now, let's get back to magnetism. Now that we have the general architecture of the electrons orbiting the nucleus, let's go into some detail regarding the electron pairs in each orbital, since this is going to be the key to the element's magnetic properties. Using the innermost shell and subshell common to every element on the periodic table, 1s as an example, if we have one electron in the single orbital, the electron is free to move about the orbital and possesses a characteristic spin or angular momentum. This spin can be either clockwise or counterclockwise and follows the left-hand rule of electromagnetism for a negatively charged particle. If the spin is counterclockwise, the left-hand rule defines an associated magnetic moment oriented downwards in the direction of the thumb. This spin is defined as minus one-half. If the spin is clockwise, the left-hand rule defines an associated magnetic moment pointing upwards and is labeled positive one-half. This single electron can possess either the plus one-half or minus one-half spin. However, things change when we add the second electron to the orbital. Since no two elementary particles in an atom can occupy the same quantum state, the second electron has to have the opposite spin as the first. Therefore, every completed orbital contains one down and one up spin electron. The same is true for the P, D, and F subshells, but there are just more orbitals to fill. For instance, in a D subshell, the first five electrons will occupy all the empty orbitals with number six pairing up with the electron in the lowest energy orbital of the subshell. Classic magnetism is observed when we have unpaired electrons in the outer shells of the atom. In the absence of a regional magnetic field, all these electrons, paired or unpaired, are free to move in 3D space. Randomly oriented, the net magnetic moment of the element is zero. However, in the presence of an external magnetic field, the small magnetic moments associated with each of the unpaired electrons are free to line up with the main magnetic field, making the element itself magnetic. The paired electrons, on the other hand, are restricted due to the fact that each possesses an opposite spin, with one oriented with, and the other against the main magnetic field. If the majority of electrons are unpaired, the element itself may show magnetic properties. And we say maybe because there's some other factors involved, such as the lattice structure of the atom and whether the atom exists in its elemental or molecular form. But we'll get into more of all of that in a moment. For the purposes of this discussion, let's assume that the electron configuration solely contributes to the classic properties of para and ferromagnetism. There are basically three or four elements that demonstrate ferromagnetism, including nickel, cobalt, iron, and sometimes gadolinium. Ferromagnetism is the strongest of the three types of magnetism, represented by this nearly pure iron cylinder with an electron configuration of argon, 3D6, 4S2. In the absence of a magnetic field, these unpaired electrons show random spin with opposite spins canceling one another and rendering the iron cylinder non-magnetic. However, when connected to a strong fixed magnet, the iron itself becomes strongly magnetic and easily picks up all the steel BBs on the platform. In the presence of a magnetic field, the four unpaired electrons in the 3D orbital all align with the magnetic field and spin together producing a unified magnetic moment or domain. These individual domains show a uniform regional magnetic moment and therefore adding all these magnetic domains together produces the strong attraction we see with the iron. In fact, the uniform alignment of the electron spins is so responsive that the iron simply has to be in the vicinity of the magnetic field without direct contact to maintain its strong magnetic attraction. Paramagnetism, represented by the gadolinium cylinder with an electron configuration of xenon, 4F7, 5D1, 6S2, on the other hand, will show an attractive force but is much weaker than ferromagnetism. Recall the iron cylinder was attracted to the fixed magnet just before the third screw on the metal guide. The gadolinium at room temperature is attracted to the fixed magnet just after the third screw. In paramagnetism, while the electrons respond to the external magnetic field, we don't see the regional uniform domains like those in iron, and therefore the induced magnetic field is much weaker. While the gadolinium is attracted to the fixed magnet, the cylinder is only weakly attracted to the steel BBs tenting towards the cylinder but too weak to lift the BBs off the platform. But gadolinium is only paramagnetic at temperatures above 20 degrees Celsius or 68 degrees Fahrenheit. 
If we cool the gadolinium cylinder in the freezer, we can actually change its magnetic properties. The metal now acts ferromagnetic, picking up all the steel BBs, maintaining its strong magnetism without direct contact to the fixed magnet, and attracting to the fixed magnet before the third screw on the metallic guide with such force that it actually pulls the cylinder off its hook. This phenomenon demonstrates the Curie ferromagnetic point of gadolinium, named after Pierre Curie, who, in 1895, discovered that magnetic materials lose or change their magnetic properties above a certain critical temperature. On a quantum level, below 20 degrees Celsius, the unpaired electrons in the DNF subshell of gadolinium all line up and spin together, forming a strong magnetic domain as seen in the iron atom. However, above 20 degrees, the heat energy is sufficient to cause some of the outer electrons to dephase, producing the observed paramagnetic properties. Gadolinium is paramagnetic at body temperature, 37 degrees Celsius, and therefore is used as a contrast agent for MR imaging. Finally, chemical elements with all or nearly all paired electrons in the orbitals of their outer electrons are diamagnetic, represented here by the cylinders of copper, argon 3D10, 4S1, and zinc, argon 3D10, 4S2. Other examples include gold, silver, and all the noble gases. At first glance, these diamagnetic elements appear to completely lack any magnetic properties whatsoever as they are not attracted to the fixed magnet. Nor will they pick up or move any of the steel balls when in direct contact with the magnet. However, if we suspend the copper cylinder from a thread, the fixed magnet appears to repel the cylinder as it approaches. However, as we pull the fixed magnet away, it appears that the copper is slightly attracted to the magnet, almost as if the copper doesn't want to be too close or too far from the fixed magnet. In diamagnetic materials, since most or all of the electrons in the outer orbit are paired, the magnetic field of the fixed magnet induces a slight magnetic moment which opposes the main magnetic field as the two are brought into proximity. As the magnet is pulled away, the induced magnetic field appears to be slightly attractive. This phenomenon can produce some interesting results including magnetic levitation as seen with this small wafer of pyrolytic graphite, a strongly diamagnetic man-made substance that appears to hover over these four fixed magnets. Now, we don't want you to be confused if you go to the periodic table with all this info. Calculate the electron configuration and find that some of your elements are actually diamagnetic instead of the predicted para or ferromagnetic. As we mentioned earlier, factors other than paired or unpaired orbital electrons can affect an element's ultimate magnetic properties. For instance, the element's crystalline lattice and sublattice structure and whether the atom exists in its elemental or molecular form. Let's look at number two first. Let's use nitrogen as an example. With an electron configuration of helium 2s2 2p3, we can see that the p subshell is exactly half filled with one electron in each of the three orbits. Should be strongly paramagnetic, correct? Well, it's not. And the reason it is not is the fact that elemental nitrogen is extremely unstable. The nitrogen gas that makes up most of our atmosphere is actually N2. With two nitrogen atoms chemically bonded together, the molecular form of this element is now very stable with all its orbitals occupied and therefore is diamagnetic. The same is true of hydrogen. The naturally occurring form of hydrogen is the molecule H2, completely filling the S subshell of both atoms. For the effects of the crystalline structure on magnetism, we'll use the element chromium. Remember the orbital configuration of iron is argon, 4s2, 3d6, and the element is strongly ferromagnetic with four unpaired electrons in the D subshell. Based on the electron configuration of chromium, argon 4s1, 3d5, we would expect this element to be extremely ferromagnetic as well, with both the 4s and 3d subshells exactly half filled, giving us a total of six unpaired orbital electrons. However, chromium reacts more like the diamagnetic elements of copper and zinc with no visible magnetic properties. In iron, as we said before, the D-shell unpaired electrons all tend to align together, forming a magnetic domain with regional magnetic homogeneity, providing the strong magnetic properties observed. In chromium, while the individual D and S subshell electrons of the atom itself respond to the external magnetic field, 
the atoms or molecular domains align with neighboring spins on adjacent sublattices pointing in the opposite directions in a regular pattern, effectively canceling any net magnetic moment of the element. This phenomenon is called antiferromagnetism. Ferry magnetic molecules, such as magnetite, a form of iron oxide, exhibit a similar phenomenon, but the alignment is asymmetric, providing a small net magnetic moment. So, pretty thorough review of electron orbital configurations and magnetism. We hope it was enlightening. If you have any questions, post them and we'll get to them as soon as possible. Thanks for watching.